Hi, everyone. It's Raghu Marcus, and I am back with another Ramdas Here and Now podcast. And before I get into what this particular talk from Ramdas is about, I just want to mention a couple of things that we have going at Love Serve Remember Foundation. One of them is a continuation of our Ramdas Soul Land Instagram live music series, which is 5 o'clock Pacific time and 8 o'clock Eastern time, Sunday night, this Sunday. And um, Papadocio is the band that is going to perform and hang out a little bit and chat about who they are and what they've been doing. And what they're doing is really amazing because they're going to do a uh, an improv. They're, the band is going to get to, together, and they'll, I guess they'll have some kind of idea what the core changes are. I don't know. <laughs> but they're going to just do an improv, and they're going to use Ram Dass material, which they've done before in one of their songs. So uh, that should be exciting, uh, to say the least. So again, that's uh, this Sunday, the 23rd of August 2020. Uh, it, it'll be uh, replayable after the fact. So if you can't be there that evening, uh, you'll be able to, 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 to uh, take a look and a listen, okay? Uh, the other thing to the, the weekend after that, that's August 28th, 29th, and 30th is a virtual retreat. We've been putting a lot, out a lot of information around that. And... Um, that features Krishna Das. It really is replacing the spring summer retreat that we could not have in Maui. So it's going to feature Annie Lamott, who we absolutely love, Annie, and uh, Robert Thurman, our good, good friend, Buddhist scholar, and Sharon Salzberg, who is uh, one of my closest friends and teachers. Really, uh, Sharon is uh, is going to join us, and Christian Das is going to do a special thing with Trevor Hall on Saturday night. That's going to be exciting. I'm going to do something with uh, Duncan Trussell and and Sharon actually. And uh, what else have we got? We got Nina Rao is going to do her chalisas, and we've got special guest Valerie Kaur who was on one of my mind-rolling podcasts recently, has a fantastic book, See No Strangers. Uh, and uh, she's, it's all about revolutionary love for Valerie. So uh, I'm excited about that. She's also going to have, as part of what she's doing, a little a chat with Annie. So that's August 28th, starting Friday evening. Go to ramdas.org slash Wise hope. Okay? That's all the announcements for today's podcast, which we picked up a, a Q&A. I love these Q&As because there's always great, great uh, questions, and, and Ramdas is really good at responding in the moment. And uh, I think the first question here is, is around the problem of the Ramayana with Sita and the way she is treated, and it addresses the whole patriarchal uh, reality that has been out through history, through our times now, which is really being addressed probably in a stronger way than ever. Uh, but he really talks about it, and he talks about it regarding the old masters that he quotes all the time. Uh, he talks about the oppression of women, uh, Sita playing a role. She's the divine mother, but she takes a certain role to play out this drama. And he talks about not thinking that he's going to, or we can rewrite historical sacred text. And, um, and he talks about how we all need to deal with this inside ourselves as we do the kind of social action that's necessary to change this dynamic. And uh, it couldn't be more topical, could it not? Um, what else? Well, he talks about, oh, this is interesting. He he talks about, in this same uh, theme, how he started to awaken with all of this 
because in one talk that he gave, he realized um, how sexist his material was that he was using. And he, um, and he started to wake up and he started to take actions that would correct that and, and have some kind of balance. So this is something he's done his whole life. This is something we all need to do. We need to do this now. And that is educate ourselves and make the kind of changes that are absolutely necessary for, for there to be equality and balance. So I, I found this particular question and his response to it was really uh, powerful. Uh, then there's um, some questions that are around committed relationships and love. And because, um, I mean, Ram Dass has talked about unconditional love that he got from Maharaji. And we've all talked about that uh, in, on many different platforms. And how does that translate over to the kind of love in a relationship? And, and so he addresses this particular question. I'll, I'll just tell you one little story uh, that happened, uh, that I actually, Krishna Das told me. He was at our mentor's home uh, during the time we were with Maharaji. And he was, uh, the mentor is Dada Mukherjee, who wrote the greatest books uh, around Maharaji. Uh, that uh, you go to ramdas.org slash shop and you'll see Dada Mukherjee um, by his grace. Uh, he, he told a story to Krishna Das saying one of our satsang brothers came over to see Dada. Again, this is during Maharaji's time, so he was, uh, we were all seeing him. Uh, but sometimes we'd spend, he'd throw us out and tell us to go anywhere and just to get rid of us. Anyhow, he went to Dada's house and he was complaining to Dada. I mean, he was really upset. He was crying because he and his uh, girlfriend, who they got together in India, had been fighting and kind of broke up and getting back together. But, you know, it was one of those things. And... Dada patted him on the back and the head and said, yeah, it'll all be okay. But he said to Krishna Das, Krishna Das, can you imagine you're with Maharaji with this unconditional love and you're crying over a relationship where it's all conditional? It's a business relationship. If you do what I like and if you're good to me, I'll do the same for you. I just thought, oh, my God, isn't that such a part of the way in which at some time it, it, it doesn't define a relationship. I've known relationships that have really unconditional love and respect, and uh, it doesn't define it. But certainly it has been part of it. For most people, we do go through that kind of phase where it's not very conditional. Unconditional, rather. It's very conditional. So uh, Ram Dass talks a lot about that, about being special to someone and letting go of that attachment. And then the other question that uh, is posed to him that I, I actually really appreciated, also so very much important in the time that we're in, and it's uh, about... Um, dealing with the reality of being in this incarnation and being in a country and being part of, of the society and being a citizen. And Ram Dass talks about um, it's the being a citizen is a process that everyone's got to take part in. So the idea is to uh, you know, play the part and do what you can do and try not to get lost in it when that you know so that brings up the whole us versus them and boy are we in that polarization now uh, it's such an almost impossible situation but i'd love uh, you'll hear him talk about it but i love how he talks about how do we learn to be a good adversary okay what does that really mean be a good adversary so we're not hating people Yet we are countering, in a very profound way, the injustices. It really, uh, really brings up the topic that is so uh, profoundly relevant 
to what we are uh, are going through and will be will be going through this fall. Is it not? Dottie used to say that. Is it not? Is it not? He just would sit and we talk. I'm just remembering how great it was being with him. We just sit around with him, and all he do was tell us one Maharaji story after another. And he spent so much close time with him. It was it was extraordinary. And in between so he'd finish the story, he'd go, Ram Ram, Ram Ram. Oh, God. That's the mantra. Ram Ram. It's all okay. We just got to, as Ram Das says, just be a part of it all. And I, I love, you know, how many times did he say in his last years, we as human can live on more than one plane of consciousness at the same time. So the action plane as well as the plane from which Maharaji, who could say this, it's all perfect. We can't say that. We don't understand that. We are not living that, and we need to take action. But at the same time, we can dip into that plane a little bit because it changes everything. So... There you go. This is Ramdas here and now. And I am Raghu, and uh, we will be back. Check out BeHereNowNetwork.com. Got a wonderful new podcast coming up from Conda Mason, uh, a podcast series. Um, check that out. Of course, uh, we've had Nikki Walton recently. Been doing stuff for a, doing some podcasts for us that are just glorious, and um, the plethora of. Great teachers, great thinkers, and loving people. Like check out Omid Safi in particular. He's fantastic. Rumi expert. Mystic, uh, East, Middle Eastern uh, mystics. He's an expert. in. Okay, good. Never mind me. Go to BeHereNowNetwork.com and check it out. And we'll see you next week on Ramdas Here and Now. She said that um, last evening when the Ramayana was being read, she got stuck in, oh, it's just another male story and the women are being, you know, stolen away. And um, I was never more aware of that than I was reading it last night. And I've thought about that. Um, see, what I, I've had this difficult time about this because for a number of reasons. Um, The story um, speaks of a, um, a set of roles, a set of dharmic roles. And um, I don't know quite how to say this. What I've done when I've had quotes from old masters, almost all of them are male reference. And so now what I do is half of the reference are to he and half to she. And I talk about the goddess as much as God. And I do all this in a way which feels both uh, realistic in terms of what we need to face now about the kind of oppression women have had. And also a kind of a, a slight shoddiness in taking ancient literature and changing it for this moment rather than seeing it for what it is and taking what you can from it and then leaving it the rest you don't like without demanding that you have a revisionist history, okay? So I have this funny thing about old books, about old tales, you know? And um, having lived in India, this is a very delicate one to re deal with because having lived in India, um, I'm aware that... Um, there are very clear role differentiations between men and women. And clearly, over time, our view of equality will prevail. But there was a way in which the dharmic roles, within the roles, because people had a really deep spiritual identity, rather than as an identity as woman or man, they were fulfilling roles, they didn't have the sense of oppression because external freedom wasn't the preoccupation in India that it now is becoming in the world. So my sense is that that story is, which has a lot of violence in it. And I keep thinking of Tipper Gore and, you know, and it has a lot of, 
it's, it's too much man stuff. Um, see, I don't know what to do because there aren't many books that spell out dharmic roles where people are so clearly filling a role but not being the role. I mean, Ram is God but being Ram. Sita, the wife, is the divine mother of the universe, but she's taken this role in order to play out this drama. Now, for me to demand that all dramas be sort of um, sanforized, you know, I have a feeling that part of the unfairness is part of the drama. And I don't know that I want to rewrite Shakespeare and do all of that. You know, I want to somehow deal with that stuff inside myself rather than changing the thing out there. And um, I was very aware a week ago, I did a benefit for AIDS in San Francisco with Chris Williamson. And Chris and I have worked up here at Omega together. And um, Chris has a very, very uh, extensive lesbian following. And she started Olivia Records and it's, it's um, very, very powerful. And so about 70% of the audience were her audience who had never heard of me actually. And um, I found when I went to prepare material, how sexist my material was, which was really good for me to see, right? I really appreciated that. And I really reached out to find the other materials to balance it, which is good, it's awakening me. And I think you're raising the question and my struggling with it is a process of awakening. I think you and I both appreciate how we deal with that though, is just this way, I think. And I don't want to throw away the story. That's the predicament. Do you hear the problem? Yeah. But I'm glad you're raising the question. Affirmative action, huh? Uh, could we read a story of Durga? No, because I'm not into the story of Durga the way I'm into the story of the Ramayana. And I only want to read out of the place of my deepest truth at this moment. There are a lot of stories I don't read anymore. They, one moment, they used to be very real for me. But I'm not just reading it to read holy stories. I'm reading it because it's a form of transmission, because this is a story that has shaped my understanding of Hanuman. And like when I say to people, one of the metaphors in that story is that Ram is, besides Sita being the divine mother and Ram being the formless, it also is true that Ram is guru and Sita is chela or devotee and devotee has been separated from God and is pining away on Sri Lanka in misery because just like we often are because we're separate from God and God says Hanuman with his ring to reassure Sita that God is always thinking about her. Now, that's very beautiful in a metaphorical system, but when you look at it from a sexual system, well, why is man God? And, you know, I mean, I can go, I can see a problem in all of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I could read Dorga to read it for you, but I couldn't do it to read it for me. Okay. See, it's interesting because when we, when Mira had the women's groups, women and spirituality, somebody said, well, what about men and spirituality? And um, it's interesting because in, in the world of spirituality, I mean, if you look at Ramakrishna, if you, if you look at all the old uh, great male saints, they all developed these huge breasts and they all ended up just being kind of a cross between a mother and a father. And to me, the spiritual world is very androgynous. I mean, I am, but I mean, I think that, and maybe it's all a projection of me, but I think that the world is primarily, the spiritual world is primarily androgynous, and it's kind of uninteresting to me who's man and who's woman. When I look at you, I don't react differently because you're a woman than a man. I mean, I can come to that level where I would, but in general, I don't. So this is the kind of struggle I have about, it's like having a group of people from New York City to me. You know, let's have a men's group. It's that kind of thing. It is a, it's a certain kind of incarnational role identity. But it's just that I'm a man this time around. 
It's like I'm a Jew on my parents' side. It's that kind of thing. And I don't mean to do it facetiously. I'm saying that if our business together is to spiritually awaken, as we come to the issue of how does spirit manifest in life, then we have to come into these issues. But in terms of first finding the identity in ourselves behind the issues or around the issues to then come back into them, this is a sequencing. And uh, so I don't consider, although I don't consider the woman's movement and the men's movement I consider them as the unfolding of karma. I don't consider those as the, um, as the main uh, spiritual work of a lifetime. Yeah. Yes. Most people, I think, have come through their early childhood experiences. I mean, most people, certainly most people my age, I don't know how much it's changed, but a lot of people have come away with a feeling of... Um, with a baseline about ourselves that's slightly negative, but that if we do good acts, we'll be good. And we're constantly sort of over compensating for something that we don't feel enough of, feeling inadequacy, whatever you want to call that. And um, sometimes it's very negative and it's got hatred in it or anger or guilt or loathing. Or... I don't think you counteract that with. The positive, I think the art is to come to the neutral of the statement, I just am. I am. I think the, the adjective that follows that is less interesting than that part of the statement. Just, I am. And um, As one cultivates qualities of centeredness, of awareness, of resting in the compassion of the heart, in just that, one sees that one does bad acts, one does good acts, one is, gets caught in things, one is free at other times. But behind it all, here we are. And there is a quality of settling into just being in the universe without loving yourself or hating yourself. And those come up as thought forms depending on your actions or your memories or your old karma. But they cease to become uh, preoccupations. They're just kind of passing winds or passing clouds. I've kidded a lot about how neuroses that were so dominant in my life over time have become these little schmoos that just come by for tea, you know? And I can have a schmoo come by that says, you know, you're really inadequate and you really have failed, you know, and you're a phony. I mean, I can run them all by. And, uh, but they don't really juice me up anymore. You know, I can't quite milk them like I used to. To the extent that you connect to the part in you where you sense the perfection of the laws of the universe, you, you sense your connectedness to all things, there is a way in which you begin to feel at home in the universe. And at that moment, you um, thought forms like I don't love myself or I do love myself or enough or all just are sort of, they dissolve, they dissolve, they dissolve. It's hard for me to describe to you the fact that I have no idea who I am, and I don't care. I don't know where I'm going, and I don't care. I don't feel I have a mission in being here with you. This is just a karmic predicament we find ourselves in. You wanted something, and I wanted something, and here we are. And there we are. And this is it. And out of it comes this. And, this, and then we all do with this what we do with it. And I kind of like that whole idea of living life in that domain. Is that, you, you hear the issue? What is the point of committed relationships or is there a place for that? Well, in India, the commitment is such that if one person dies, the other person usually goes on the funeral pyre. So that's a certain degree of commitment. 
Unfortunately, it used to be women that went on the funeral pyre, so we've got to clean that one up, haven't we? Yes. <laughs> I'm on your side, you know. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So horrible beauty of the universe. We certainly got screwed up, didn't we? Um, I don't know, as a wandering sadhu, whether I'm the person to talk to about that. Uh, I got to forewarn you, um, because to me, um, my guru's statement, "Love is the only marriage contract," is what I really hear. I think. I think that if you and I are fully straight with each other in this moment as well as we can be, and then if at that moment, if it's enough, we go to the next moment, and if it isn't, we don't. And I really think that I demand that of the situations I'm in. And um, I really hear the Gandhi line, my commitment is to truth, not to consistency. And I have spent so many years living out old contracts that my mind under certain types of attachment of fantasy or projection or fear created that then I was too moral a person to walk away from, that I'm not going to create them if I can help them. Okay. However, if you are in one, like you take a marriage that you said till death do us part, and then everybody gets to hate each other. Okay. Now, should you split or shouldn't you would be a question. And I would say from a karmic spiritual point of view, it doesn't matter. Because either way, you're going to grow immensely from a spiritual point of view. From a psychological point of view, of course it matters. But from a spiritual point of view, I don't see that it does. It's just a, two paths in a road, and each one is going to present you. If you leave, all of the effects of having walked away from something are going to be with you. And if you stay in it, all of the deadness and struggle and wishing you were somewhere else is going to be with you. I mean, there is incredible spiritual growth from two people that are locked in it, sitting down, looking at each other, and trying to get straight until they can cut through and then coming to a new level. That's absolutely beautiful. A lot of people can't do that because the stuff that they're caught in with another human being that they're living with is so powerful that they're really asleep in it. And... I watch people, they take ecstasy, and for a moment they come into a great new thing, and then these very deep patterns which determined how they came together in the first place keep reasserting themselves. And there is a lot of... But I'll tell you, as I'm saying this, I just want to say something else, that I've become very aware of how we have thrown the baby out with the bath in not valuing the extended family enough so that I know that when I took care of dad as he was dying, at some deep level, that was absolutely right on in a very profound, harmonious way of being, he was my father, he had nurtured me, and it was appropriate. It wasn't just psychological, it wasn't nice that I'm doing this for him. It was a deeper rhythmic thing. It was a deeper appropriateness. And I am a product of I'm not a product of the 60s. I was here long before that, but I, I'm a product of that attitude in which individuality is so valued. Individualism and the freedom to do what you want that the whole web of love that would give you meaning and support in your life that comes from the extended family, I threw over. And it was only, it's only now, you know, as I'm old that I'm starting to, I'm not really, but I, uh, I'm supposed to say that because I'm 61, the body's 61, that as, that as I get to this point, I realize now that that web was something that I did violence to in my zeal to get enlightened. And I realize that you have to fully honor an incarnation. And some people's incarnation is to go it alone. And some people's incarnation is to stay in a relationship. And I just don't see a rule for the game. I really don't. I don't see a rule. 
I just want to keep all these things in balance, that the, the family web, I think the children and the old people are really getting screwed in the society because that web isn't extended. I think there's something very supportive for a child to have the grandparents and the uncles and the aunts and the friends and the stable community. I think it's beautiful. I don't think it's horrible if they don't, and we're probably it's a whole new thing, but I, I feel that I just feel the old people particularly are suffering because that generational independence is uh, cutting people off from stuff that keeps their hearts open. And we've lost elders. We just have old people. I mean, we've done a job on ourselves culturally in our zeal to be independent and free. But I can't look in California where it's 50 some odd percent of the marriages end in divorce and say, well, this is morally bankrupt. I don't think it is. I just think it's a change in the form of social institutions. What was bizarre to me was that as the family situation broke down, everybody started to create these surrogate families like AA. So now instead of half your family being drunk, everybody's drunk, you know, it's a far out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get it for that, but that's all right. IAA does wonderful work. Just... Questions? Yeah. The quality of love, first of all, let's just, let's for the sense sake of it, talk about planes of consciousness. And if you and I meet on a plane in which we are merged in love and we are in love, in the space of love together, we also have these other planes where we have two bodies, where we have two personalities, where we have two separate karmic predicaments. And um, each of those situations has its own laws connected with it. And what you're doing is as you enter into an, one plane of love, that doesn't mean all the other planes don't exist. They're all relatively real and they each have their unfolding law. And if you listen, you hear your own karma. They have in it the attractions and the repulsions. They have in it the fantasies and the desires. They have in it the old childhood experiences, previous incarnations. That's all part of your karma. You, the quality of love, of presence with another human being is outside of karma or it's the result of waking up. But at that moment, you are not in time and not in space and karma is in time and space. It's something that's unfolding lawfully and you're working it through and throwing it over. So I can go through a group of people as I trust my intuition more or get so many letters and I look and I see this one I have to answer. And this one, it would be okay if Marlene, my assistant, answers it. And uh, there's another phone call I've got to make and another I can't make. And there's somebody I spend 10 minutes with and somebody I hug and pass on. And I just got to listen. And it's not a judgment that they're better or worse. It has something to do with the immediacy of the moment and the requirement. And I trust that intuitive feeling. And I feel that um, you can see that a marriage built on, a, on sexual attraction is in for rocky road sooner or later because something's going to change. And it usually does rather quickly. Um, and you can see that marriages based on economics usually have a rocky road. And with that kind of wisdom, you listen for the fact of, on the level of your karmic psychodynamics, compatible needs, interests, shared interests, and so on. The question is whether you're identified with that or just fulfilling that. Like I have this body, I have to take better care of it. I've got high blood pressure, it turns out. Me, peaceful me, has high blood pressure. So I got to lose 20 pounds. I got to get more exercise. I got to eat lower on the pyramid. I mean, I'm, give, I'm being instructed by everybody. And I'm sure I'll die sooner or later, I, I expect. Now, in the meantime, I have to take care of my body. It's not that I'm busy being fat with high blood pressure. I just happen to have a 74 MG, you know, that's my car. This is my body. With the MG, I can rebuild the engine or I can junk it. With this, I can take care of it or it'll fall apart. Those are the laws of my body. 
I'm just watching them. I'm not buying in. I'm just doing it. And in a way, it's the same thing in human relations. Ultimately, the forms we dance with each other are just the forms we dance with each other. And the essence is, lies behind it. It lies behind it. So specifically taking your question, if you don't use love as the criterion, how do you know who to marry? That's the question. I would say that if the two of you would sit together in love, in the deepest quality of love, and listened carefully, you would know. You would hear the whole gestalt, including the laws, the past, the future, the present, the opportunities, and you'd know, and you'd have to trust that. And that's, I would say, that when you listen from the quietest of mind, truth waits for eyes unclouded by longing. And when you come into the place behind the longing, into just you here, I'm here, and then you sit together quietly and just feel your way, not discuss it, not reason about it, just feel your way through it, it becomes clear. Being able to experience grief without getting lost in it. I don't think we should spend our lives trying not to have emotions for fear we're going to get lost in them. I think it's better to, the fact that you are here in this gathering means that something has started to happen to you in the sense of awakening out of the thickness of a single plane of reality. And I think that you are justified in having some faith in the fact that that process is happening to you. And that when situations arise for grief, like your brother's illness, and his imminent death, I think that you should let yourself feel whatever you feel and just ride with it and then realize that at some point you'll come up for air because this, this, you're asking this question of me and here we are. Do you hear that? I think that the attempt to be strong is a kind of strength that isn't coming out of the strength of being rooted in the depth of of the truth of the matter. And I think it's, it's, our culture reinforces strong meaning stiff upper lip. And I don't think that's strength. I think that's social coercion in a certain kind of a way. So, I mean, I encourage people to cry and rage and, you know, scream and, and express anger. And when you're with, uh, your brother express the unfairness and the anger and because the most important thing you can share with somebody that is going through a transition out of their body is truth. And I don't think you can lay up truth on somebody who doesn't want to hear it, but you can listen in to hear how close that person will come to wanting to share truth with you and then be as truthful as you can. I mean, people come and they say, I don't know how to be with somebody that's dying. Can you give me a book to read? And, and the horror of somebody coming to you to sit down, you know, and you say this just a minute and you look up the response. People say, would you train me in how to work with the dying? And then you get a credential saying Ram Dass certifies you as a dyer, you know, and uh, what a what a joke. I mean, the. I walk in still, I mean, I walk, not still, I'm sure I will for a long time, but I walk in like some years ago, I walked into, I was called to the woman's bedside who was a lawyer. She was dying of cancer um, of the brain. She had three young children. Um, and I arrived on Christmas day, uh, freeway driving, came in, family treats me like uh, Santa Claus has just arrived. He's come, you know, and they're because they don't know what to do about this situation about their mother. And I'm shipped upstairs. I don't even have my coat off. My hands are still cold. And I walk into this room and there's this woman, this beautiful woman lying on the bed. And I go and I sit down and I'm so speedy from the freeway. I begin becoming Mr. Helpful. You know, I'm going to help you get through death. And it takes me a little while to slow down to look into her eyes to find out she's way beyond that. She's just 
waiting for me to finish with all my bullshit so we can be together. And it took me a while to get off it, you know, and I really see that working with people that are close to death straightens you up very quickly, very quickly, especially if you have a taste for truth, if you have a taste for the spirit. You know the truth and the spirit are intimately linked. And as I say, you don't lay it on somebody who doesn't want to hear it. If somebody doesn't want to know they're dying, you don't go and say, hey, you know, you know, you're about to die. But if somebody says, am I dying? And you think they are, I think it would be useful to share it with them because it's a great opener for conversation. Mm -hmm. She's talking about the process of letting go of the process of wanting to be special to somebody else. I don't know why you have to let it go. You just have to let go of your attachment to it. I mean, I can live with somebody and we love each other a lot and I say, am I special to you? Oh, very special. And then we both laugh. I mean, we're very special because that's the drama of it, you know. Am I special? Of course. And then behind it, here we are. And this is a moment of beauty and truth. And this is what we got. This is it. This is it. The thing is, you begin to see your personality needs as insatiable. That one need just gets substituted with another sooner or later. Somebody says... You're very special to me. The next question is, you know, but really? Or are you special enough to, you know? And it's back with this question about feelings of lack of self-love. That when you find the place in yourself where you just are, you are. And you are unique. And you are part of the universe. And you're one with God and it's all empty, and it's all dream stuff, and it's all true, and here we are, all of it. And sometimes you may say, you know, you're not special for me. And if I really am spacious in my awareness, I see your mouth open and these words come out and you're telling me about you, not about me. I'm a beautiful human being. If you don't like me, that's your problem, not mine. Unless I buy it. You don't like me? Ooh. No. Well, maybe next life. I'll wait. Where are we going to go? Yeah. I mean, you still have to play with it. You just play with it because you see the intensity of the drama and how the world turns and how on and on it goes, the whole stuff of personality. And so, as Danny and Tara suggest, you become mindful of it. You begin to be aware of how it all works. You keep seeing yourselves doing repetitive patterns and you can spend the rest of your life trying to work them out and interpret and understand and analyze and work on them. Or you can treat them as thoughts or phenomena. They are phenomena and they're gonna go on because you do have a personality and you do have a body. And there are nesting feelings and there's connectedness feelings. And I mean, there are many of my friends, if they don't have a home and a family, they are feeling extremely unable to do inner work. And for others, their home and their family seems a tremendous obstacle. For some of my friends, wandering, like for me, it seems to be a wonderful sadhana. I find great peace in just being this kind of liquidity. Others are wandering and they're miserable. I think it's less interesting what form your life is in than the state of your being. And as your state of your being gets deeper, you can take the forms, whichever ones arise, and kind of work with them. And that includes sickness and dying and opportunities and lack of opportunities and being around miserable people or being around beautiful people or being frustrated. Great sadnesses. The personality is like the sandpaper. It's the stuff of the incarnation. And the art is to, I mean, I see my own personality as, 
as extremely, first of all, it's like, um, it's like looking at these trees. Each of them has its own unique characteristic, but they're beautiful and they're, I appreciate them. I appreciate the trees. I don't have to judge them. I appreciate them. And I find I don't have to judge people either. I can just appreciate them. And even when they say, I don't think you're special, I really see that as their mind speaking now. And I've learned not to, everybody has these mind nets of reality that they put out, these huge nets like Dr. Strange comics, you know. And they're saying, this is who I am, this is who you are, this is who I am, this is who you are, this is what reality is, and they're really strong. And if you've got, you know, if you have a parent, two parents that have a strong one of those, you buy in and it takes you a long time. It's like a tuna being netted, you know. You got caught in a mind net. And what I see is I meet each person and it's like projective systems coming towards you. Each person is looking at you and telling you who they think you are. And what they're seeing is the projections of their own relation to their father or whatever it is. They don't know who I am. I don't know who I am. How could they know? <laughs> this isn't responsible. Yes. <laughs> I'm a, um, a, a member, because of my incarnation, of a number of, of systems, of which one is a political system. And in order to honor my incarnation, it means that I'm a citizen. And I have to, whatever that means, I have to be part of it. It's a process that I have to be part of. And that if I push it away, it's got me. Or if I become obsessed with it, it's got me. What I have to do is find a way to be, to fulfill it, to be, play my part, to be all the different roles I have in the world, to just fulfill them, not to be lost in them or to reject them, but just to do what I have to do in each one. And in my understanding of the political system and as a lack, as a non-compassionate one or a relatively uncompassionate one, I feel, a part of me feels incredible pain, just as you do. I mean, I work in Guatemala, so I do understand what, how culpable our government is for the suffering that's going on to these beautiful Mayan people. When I look at the politicians involved, I can empathize with how they got into that predicament. I see the forces acting upon them inside themselves and in the social structures they're working in. And I realize that I'm part of the web of it all. For example, I know that it's my choosing to drive my car someplace that is feeding something in the system that is leading to our Middle East policy that is leading to, and there's a way in which I'm a conspirator in the whole game. And so what I feel is that I often externalize the blame. I often say, you know, if he were good, things would be wonderful without realizing that I'm part of the web. Uh, I feel that in, in the issue, like in Aikido, that when you have somebody that you feel is doing the wrong thing or a negative force or a dark force and you want to act against it, there has to be a way to act appreciating their energy in a way so that the result of the interaction is, as, as Gandhi said, I want the British to leave India, but I want them to leave as friends. It's that one. That if I see Casper and all the people that that represents uh, as them to be pushed against with all of my being, what I do is give them power. And there is another way in which they are that part of us that represents that part of the system. In other words, I'm talking about planes again, where I see we're us here, but we're also them there. And I will say, no, you can't do this, or this is wrong, or I'll vote against you, or I'm going to put out an ad saying that you are irresponsible and you shouldn't be reelected or whatever. At the same moment is the question is where my heart is in relation to that. And whether I 
externalize and project outward, or whether I just say this is part of the web of the human condition, of which I'm part and they're part, and in my dance, I have this moral code and this set of awarenesses that leads me to say, because I'm representing the woman in Guatemala that the government is screwing, I have the responsibility to say this, but how I say it is the next question, not that I say it, and who I see I'm saying it to is as important. And the interesting thing is whether you can be a really good adversary in a way that draws you closer together, or does adversarial things have to take you apart? Am I dealing with that question at all? Yeah. Yes. She's asking me about my visit to Dachau concentration camp last year. Well, I think whether Jew or non-Jew, the realization of the immensity of the Holocaust in terms of the human condition um, has brought many people so close to the edge of the mystery of is there a good God or what is the universe about? And I felt that I was drawn to Dachau because I felt that that scene and the standing there in the presence of those souls that had died there and the people who had inflicted that kind of cruelty on fellow human beings, just being there would um, take me deeper into the mystery of what that is about. And then as a Jew, I realized that part of why I haven't been able to be, to fully acknowledge the incarnational aspect of being Jewish was because of my fear of the pain of the horror of the predicament of the Jews. And I mean, if you read Elie Wiesel's book, Night, for example, you just be aware of the the, the spiritual edge that beings were taken to in that situation. And when I went there and walked through the bunkhouses and walked down the line and thought about their lives and I was choking, I couldn't even breathe out of the, the, the horror of what humans could do to one another. And then I came to the, um, these three chapels at the end. One was a Protestant, one was a Catholic, and one was a Jewish chapel. And I came up to the Jewish chapel, which was a long brick like a tunnel. And in the front end, it was smaller in the front end than the back end. It went up in the back. And when you looked down, it was very dark inside. And there was a, um, an iron grill in front that was shaped like barbed wire. It had barbs coming out. And you put your fingers on it. And you looked in. You didn't go in. Nobody went in. You just looked in. And you looked down this long, dark tunnel. And it was very dark. And then your eyes were drawn down to the end where there was a, a change in the color of the stones. So your eyes went up. And then at the top, there was this tiny little hole of light. And your eyes went down through this and up to that light. And it was something about faith and pain and darkness, and there were a whole quality, a uh, set of qualities that I went through. And I started to think about what my life has been like and how, what it would have been like had I been living in one of those cities where suddenly I had to wear a thing on my shirt because I was a Jew, and then later on I was told I couldn't live here, but I'd have to live there. And then later on, I was brought into a square. And then later, I was put into a truck. And then I was taken somewhere. And I thought about people's lives and what they tried to hold and then lost. And I just experienced there but for, because I came from my family, just a couple of generations are Polish and Russian and Litvaks. And, and uh, I, you know, I'm 
that's it. That's those are those are my relatives. They're my family. And uh, and I, I mean, the experience is burned into me, burned into me. Just walking those paths and sitting there and walking into the ovens and seeing the showers and and the pictures in the museum of the tattooed arms. And the whole way of, of human spirit and human degradation and the meaning of moments of existence. It was very profound. I, I, I treasure it. I treasure it. And at the same moment, at the same moment, there is a lot of space in me. I don't end up caught in it. I just, it's like the fullness, it's like your heart you can keep your emotional heart open so that it's breaking moment after moment after moment. And beyond the unbearable, here we still are. Here we still are. And that's part of it, that you, as you start to continue on the spiritual path, you're able to look more directly at the immensity of the human suffering, of, the, of all, not just human, animals and earth and all of it without blinking, without turning away, without being frightened of it. And you, the thing that frightens you about pain is that your heart breaks so and it hurts so. And you can get so that it's constantly hurting and constantly breaking and behind it and within it is joy. And it's extraordinary. And it's extraordinary. And in that way, I was asking the people who had been through that process at Dachau to give me the transmission to allow me to be a holder of their pain to go on with my life as a statement of theirs, just like I feel with the women in Guatemala. Okay. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.